as the first of July, um, and we're in the walks and suites um, at the University of Waterfall. Um, my name is Councillor Lucy Thompson, and I'm uh, Chair of the Cabinet and Leader of the Council. Um, please tonight so advise everybody that the open parts of the meeting are being audio recorded and live streamed from the Council's website. In addition, a video recording of the meeting will be uploaded to the Council's YouTube channel in uh, shortly after the meeting. <coughs> Please can I remind any officers joining virtually to turn off their cameras and mute their microphones until invited to speak. And please can I remind members to speak clearly and remember to use your microphone. Finally, please can I ask everyone to ensure mobile phones and other electronic devices are on silent or switched off in time. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we've got quite a a long agenda um, today, and we have allocated um, slightly extra time uh, for this meeting, as well as obviously starting half an hour earlier than usual. Um, but number one, uh, first on the agenda is apologies for absence. Thank you very much. Um, item number two, membership of cabinet bodies. And it's to confirm Newlands Parish Council are entitled to nominate two representatives to the West Water Newville Hall. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, item number three disclosure of interest. Uh, yes, Leader, um, I need to declare a person with a long prejudicial interest as a county council. Thank you very much, Councillor Tolls. Um, I don't believe there are any other expressions of interest needed to be made. Um, item number four to note any requests from councillors to make representations. Um, I note that there are several councillors who would like to speak on um, various items coming up and if it's okay with you, I will call you when the item is introduced. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item number five minutes of previous meeting held on the 23rd of June, less the extended minute. Um, I hope you've all had a chance to read them, and are we are we willing to approve that they were truly recommend that true? And the reflection of meeting. Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, item number six public participation. Um, and I have a number of uh, members of the public who do wish to speak um, at, at this point. Um, I've also got members of the public who wish to speak um, primarily uh, on the uh, Central Regions to Regeneration paper. Um, and as I would take those members of the public when we get to that item. Um, but first up, um, on public participation, um, we have the Mr. Tate. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my statement questions are not on anything specifically mentioned in the agenda. Uh, it's just referring back to one of the exempt items. Uh, in the full council of the 7th of July, reference was made to the purchase of 54 homes in Wyoming, and sort of going round in circles, I, I, I'm assuming that they are North Wyoming, part of the urban extension. So, part of the, the, the statement I want to make, or comments I want to make, I was part of the planning committee that determined the North Wyoming urban extension of 4,000. 500 houses, which was a strategic uh, development area, in order to deliver 40% housing, so 1,400. Uh, I couldn't support uh, the recommendation to approve. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't challenge the viability that 10% of the affordable housing was by virtue of a commuted sum, so off-site. So I am just intrigued what's happening to that 17 and a half million pounds. Is some of that going back into potentially into North White into 554 homes? Uh, so it's just intriguing. Uh, 
I'm sort of out of slightly out of touch with with council matters, but I have tried to draw back the uh, the North Bike Development Forum notes and, and other uh, minutes that, that uh, Sarah's committee's made, and I just can't quite fully understand it. Uh, I, as many members of the cabinet were, I went to the uh, Kingsworthy top field uh, opening, which was very impressive. But it's just trying to understand where all these developments fit in to the bigger scheme. The, the council had a challenging target for affordable housing, but someone who's quite passionate in that area is just having a better understanding of how those homes are going to be delivered. And I, I put here, I feel a little bit like Donald Rumsfeld. I appreciate it was an exempt paper, but I don't know what I don't know. It's one of the great un unknowns. So it's really just general uh, stirring of, of officers and members over that affordable housing uh, policy and to better understand when there will be information about the 54 homes, which other than the purchase price, I don't understand why there couldn't have been more context to what this was about. So grateful for the opportunity to address the committee uh, and, and I, I'm assuming that there won't be any clear answers to those questions or statements, but grateful for the opportunity to address the Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Tate. Um, I mean, one reason why it, it, it wasn't exempt is that we are still in negotiation with the aspects so I desire uh, that the, the people couldn't be uh, <coughs> more open. Um, I don't know whether any cabinet member wants to come in and um, help on this matter when we can. Councillor Lynn. Yeah, um, I think. I um, certainly understand where Mr. Tate is coming from. Um, as he says, we recognise his passion for affordable housing. Um, we are in a situation where we do want to keep matters commercially exempt, but uh, I'm happy to um, contact Mr. Tate um, as soon as we're able to I'll take advice on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the other person I have to um, address if I know on the HRA uh, uh, is Monty Hill. Um, and uh, I don't even like to speak now because this is basically what's the way for us. I get a whole of me. It's not that I get a lot of weight. Right, okay. Um, yes, we um, met with um, Mr. Johnson virtually and were uh, happy with the um, he turn. Um, the only question we've been asked since that meeting, and I think Mr. Light may have raised this at scrutiny, was the fact that we heard that um, property services were now going to be part of the state. We were concerned that some of the funds from the HRA may be used for um, the states. Um, I think um, that's, that's really what we want to get up, really. Um, and this may be just some sort of spin to stories, I don't know, but we, we do have to, as we're representing tenants, we do have to make sure that we represent them if they ask these and query these queries. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, <coughs> um, I don't know if you have an answer to that. Um, Mr. Bowden. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it, it, it was a question that I was proposing uh, to uh, respond to uh, uh, in, in presenting the papers today, but uh, um, I, I, just, yeah, I appreciate one of the single points. Um, I have uh, written to David Lyon following the, the, screen, the screen meeting, which is one of the previous questions. Uh, with, respond, with regard to the specific question uh, that Michael raises today, um, I can confirm that there has been no change to the, 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 uh, the current management arrangements for any of the housing team, but oh, sorry, for the, for the property services team, the new homes team, actually aligns with the previous service team. I did meet with tax over a year ago now, I think, um, to outline those proposals and to reassure tax that there would be absolutely no change to services to our, to our tenants or to the way that um, council staff are funded. We are very well controlled. Through the, through the housing revenue account pretense, which means we can only spend housing revenue account monies on delivering housing services to our tenants. 
uh, and I can categorically put a short, a short tag for that. That's a case. I have met with Julie on the head of the corporate of housing and, and agreed um, a form of messaging she, so she will come to that and, and cover this issue because we do appreciate the, the concern that any any use of housing funds can uh, cause us um, can, can cause people to get to residents. Um, but just to be assured, I mean, some, some estates some are already funded through the housing account because they do the housing services. Um, where, where teams sit within the council, irrespective of, of um, um, management arrangements, you know, whether they are charged to the council peripheral account, it depends wholly on whether they are concentrating on housing services and, and just to reassure that it is something that uh, uh, I've always been very careful to, to ensure that, uh, um, that we maintain that, that we uh, apply the range rules um, and any changes that we're considering at the moment don't, don't, don't change. Thank you very much for both of them. That's very reassuring. So thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. Um, right, uh, that concludes the uh, public participation. So we now go on to item number seven, Peter and the Cabinet Member Analysis. Um, I don't have any announcements to make. Thank you, Peter. Just to report on the prior to being update, there was another successful prosecution. Uh, this was a lady caught in Bookham, where I live, as you know, so that was that's all been done. Also, I'm pleased to announce that cameras are now ready to install. We're getting signs printed which go alongside them. There are several locations in the area. Denry, Southwark, Chin, Lambledon, Mitchell Dewa, Otterport, the A34, all the lay bys, A272, Eastfield Road, lay bys, heading north out of Cheriton, A303, all the lay bys, and over road north, so they're going in everywhere, and we are very pleased on that. Also, could I just mention? applications to the small grant scheme got off to a very strong start after they reopened mid June with applications received from a variety of different voluntary groups and the first small panel meeting to review applications is to be held in August and the grants team are working very hard on continuing to promote community grants to different stakeholder groups and the team have also held members briefings on July the 6th and attended a charity leaders meeting organized by Community First on the 14th of July and I would encourage all organizations looking for funding to contact, contact us and discuss their plans because it's going very well indeed. Thank you Lena. Thank you very much, Councillor Tim. Um, Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Lisa. I'd like to just give an update on our new climate emergency open forum. Um, after much discussion on the Steering and Health Environment Policy Group, we plan to have this open forum with quite a relaxed format. So the panel will discuss questions from the public. Questions by the forum, I think. There will be a different topic for each forum, and the panel will vary with each time before meeting. We aim to have three each year. First, we'll plan for Monday, 27th of September, that will be a lovely week. We're currently setting up polls so that everyone has a chance to vote on what we'd like the first talk to be. I think this will be an exciting way to not only showcase what we, the City Council, are doing, but also to hear from and share resources with interested groups, communities, and businesses in our districts. It will also be a chance for us to hear from people outside our districts who will hope these players all be even more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Murphy. Um, I don't believe there are any other announcements to make. Um, so we will move on with the agenda. Item number eight, Central Winchester Region of Generation Delivery, um, have uh, B3303 on pages 13 to 152 of the agenda plan. Um, Councillor Lynn, would you like to introduce the video, please? Thank you, Leader. Um, I'm really pleased to bring forward the next formal stage in our plans to transform Central Winchester 
Uh, we had widespread support for our outline development proposals late last year, and have been working on the practicalities of how we deliver the objectives of the Central Winchester SPD and to contribute to our council plan outcomes. Before us today, the strategic outline business case and approval to progress work on the outline business case, as well as proposals for meanwhile use of kids. I do think these stages of the process will be rather less confusing in the end, but it's important to emphasise that we are at the strategic outline business case today, um, and the business case comes later. Um, we did share the outline of the decisions proposed today, as well as an update on various issues to the public in the open forum several weeks ago, um, as well as uh, to members on a separate event. But I'd just like to invite uh, Barry and Lyons, our head of programme, to recap the key issues. Barry. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Chair. I've got a presentation which I will share now, hopefully. There we go. So what I'm going to do this morning is really quickly run through um, a short presentation. We have shared this information both in the open forum and at a couple of other events that we've recently had, both with members of the scrutiny committee. So um, it's, it's, it's a short presentation to run through the key elements of the report today, which is really looking at the strategic outcome case and, and what, our, what the proposals are with recommendations to King's Walk. So, as Councillor mentioned just now, it's, it's, it's a little bit tricky to see up there on the screen, but there's, there, there is a set process. We, we follow guidance issued by HM Treasury in its approval process for business case uh, completion. Stage one is the strategic outline case. You can see there, stage one, and that's, all, that's the draft strategic outline case we've currently got for approval today. We then propose to move forward to the outline business case, which looks at the preferred delivery route in more detail. And then finally, the full business case is completed at stage three. So you can see there the different stages of the business case process. Again, to reiterate the strategic outline case where we are at the moment really does concentrate on the strategic reasons for doing the project and also looking at uh, the wider economic um, and social benefits that that might deliver for us, which we then go on to look further in detail at the next stage. So the strategic outline case, many of you will be familiar with this, um, the case of change, very much focused on key policies and key documents, again, all of which you'll be aware of and have been shared previously. So again, I won't go on too much on those. And leading on there from what we as the council propose that the Central Winchester Regeneration Area will deliver, what are our investment objectives? Again, this is within the elements of the strategic outline case, um, which is available online and also has been shared previously. So, uh, many of you will be familiar with the terms here, the live, work, play, um, student experience, overnight tourism, and running across everything is, of course, that sustainable development. And in order to measure different options for delivery and different approaches, there are critical success factors that we need to meet and expect delivery to meet. Again, these have been shared before, but as we go through and look at the different options for the delivery of Central Winchester, we're looking at what the alignment to the city needs are, how it aligns to the SPD, and various other key critical success factors. So, the long list of options, again, that we have talked about in the consultation, but um, again, we went through these uh, in, at the Open Forum, and again, fully available online um, through the SOC documents, really looks at the delivery options available to the council for the delivery of central Winchester. Various different levels of control and risk, and you can see on the left-hand side of that slide, lesser control um, and lesser risk. We're looking at disposing of the site at one extreme, moving across to the right-hand side of that slide, greater control and greater risk, leading with that, that master developer role for the council bringing forward delivery itself. And there are various other options in between, 
all details in the strategic outline case. On top of the investment objectives that we identified earlier and also the critical success factors, in looking at the delivery of, of, of Central Winchester and what route is best delivered, um, the Council also has key factors that it has to consider. You know, again, in its control, risk, um, and again, this is something that we shared back through consultation and it's available online. The scoring matrix, it is a little bit tricky to see on, on the big screen, obviously, but all the different elements, all the different delivery options have been sort of ranked and scored against all those different factors that we were talking about, cost, risk, control, and you can see there at the, um, let's see if I can hold up those. Okay. Uh, 20, uh, uh, the option four and option five, thank you, there you go, um, show a high score there of 24 and 27. And that's looking across the key elements that we need to consider, risk, control, cost, speed and delivery, etc. So those were then chosen and taken forward to be of the shortest options, which we then went on to look further to the strategic outline case. Now, um, you might also know there is another figure 24 there, which looks at disposal, but you can see there that if you look at the control row, there's very little control that the council would have directly over the delivery of that option. So it has been ruled out of the shortlisted options because obviously that is a key concern and key issue um, for the council to have that control over what is delivered. Um, so that's why that has not been taken forward. And also looking at the other end, the master developer has gone four against that, which means there's an awful lot of control that the council would have. But if you look at all the other factors, the risk, the, uh, the, the cost, um, then it's, it's very much more um, just the option really. And, and, and it's not really something that the council feels it could uh, enter into, and you can see that it is it's not on those. So that's why it didn't speak very highly as we went through the shortlisting. So you can see the two extremes, but what we have got is the shortlisted options of option four, which was uh, the council to deliver in King's Walk and finding a development partner for the remainder of the site, and option five, a development partner across the site. These two shortlist options were then measured against those critical success factors. Again, it's a little bit difficult to see on the screen, but again, it's all online, so do go and have a look. And you can see there that option five, which is the single development partner, scores 23, which is the highest score of those two shortlisted options. So that is why it is the preferred option through the strategic outline case. And this slide here, again, it goes into a little bit more detail about the advantages and disadvantages. Um, as, as to how those scores uh, were, 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 were arrived at. Again, do take a look online, that really goes into a little bit more detail. So the preferred option, you can see there, option five at the bottom, is through the development agreement um, across the site. And just to clear up the site that we're talking about, there's this diagram here, this plan. So you can see there the red line is the SPD area that was covered by the SPD that was adopted back in 2018. You can see there, the, it's difficult to see here, but there is a fluorescent green line there, which showed the area that we were consulting on uh, through the CWR development proposals. And you can see the blue line there, which is the area that we're currently talking about when we refer to the site. So we refer to that as the defined site. And that is the council owned land within the SPD area that we currently are able to consider uh, development. The reason it doesn't currently include Middlebrook Street Car Park, we will probably come on to a little bit later, but we need to retain flexibility for the future to work alongside how it comes to movement strategy with regards to future movement around city and buses. Um, and you can see there that the blue line also doesn't cover at the moment the wall state and small site, which was included as the sort of cultural offer when we were talking through the development proposals. And that purely is because at the moment it's not within our gift, it's not within our ownership, but that is not to say that we are not still looking at it, and that is still a very active work stream going forward. So that's the defined site. And then this slide here just talks around what a development agreement actually is, how it can work, 
the types of things that can be included in that development agreement. And again, it's gone into in more detail in the strategic outline case. So what we have also taken into account is why and how this is different from last time. We are all aware, obviously, that uh, there was a previous scheme through development agreement. Um, and what we want to do now is to really reinforce why doing development agreement this time is, is, is different from, from how it worked out before. Primarily, the council is now the majority landowner across the site, and particularly across the defined site, we are the landowner. So we have got control over the, um, the, 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 that site and, and how we bring it forward. Because we're in that commanding position with regards to the fact that we're landowners of that defined site, we can choose the development partner that best suits what we need to get and what we would like to get from development. So, um, with regards to procurement, the red lines, our, our objectives, we're very much more in control. And then, having chosen the right development partner, we will then be able to work alongside them in partnership as the plans and the proposals come forward. There's a slide again that you can have a look at later online that really talks through the process that we would look to go through to find that development partner. And then, really, again, addressing how this route does um, relate to the SPD. Obviously, we're all aware that the SPD states the, the, uh, the, that it envisages um, that there will be multiple developers and multiple smaller parcels of land. So, on first you know, viewing, and, 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 and it seems to me that by choosing a single development partner across the defined site, that uh, it, it seems to represent an apparent departure from, from what the um, SPD envisaged. But again, on further analysis, which has gone through in the Cabinet report, so due to that 13.6, um, it is considered that the uh, proposal to go with the single development partner is consistent with the group envisaged by the CWRS meeting. Um, and again, much more detail on that. But there are a couple of reasons there for why that is the case. So you'll note that the third option is a single member partner across the divine site, but that doesn't mean to say that we're not still looking to bring forward some early activity at Kingsport because we know that isn't really popular and really um, something that the council is fully committed to because we want to support the high street after COVID, we want to support the local communities and the local. Um, creatives. So, what we intend to do um, is to bring forward a meanwhile use this three year program whilst we find development partners to bring forward the long term vision of that previous quarter. So, we've already got budgets which was approved back in March to do some uh, improvements to the public realm and to the ground floor of King's Walk. We then also have done considerable amounts of work looking at the structure of the building, the condition of the building, and all that information was fed into the strategic outline case, um, which has led us to the, 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 the um, fact that it's, it, it's, it's really expensive to bring things back into use. So therefore, um, we will be looking to do something on the ground floors, um, and therefore we are seeking further funding through this cabinet report to enhance that original budget of £200,000, which we had back in March, to do over and above what was already agreed to really make that, that change and that statement around King's Law. So, next steps, you can see here, again, the timeline is one that we've been uh, used before. It's very difficult to see again on the screen. But what we're now doing is seeking approval um, on the strategic outline case to move forward to the next phase, which I should remember from the to the outline business case, where we will look in more detail and fully assess um, all the different um, ramifications of moving forward with that preferred delivery option. Um, and we aim to come back in um, the autumn to cabinet, but again, Obviously, prior to that, there will be the rounds of engagement um, and, and consultation if required, engagement and, and chances to share with the public and key stakeholder groups ahead of that cabinet decision. So, 
a whistle stop tour, I'm afraid, but it, it is all online. The only thing I would like to say at this stage is that the strategic outline case is is was prepared with us for, for us by JLL and the there's a little bit that's been left out of that which we will need to include as we adopt it, which is just the assumptions and it, it, it clearly states that the, the figures and the, and the viability and the appraisals that were done were not red book appraisals, they were purely for consultancy basis to enable us to get to a decision as to the best preferred route. So I think we just need to clarify that this morning. Thank you, Councillor uh, Thank you, Barry. Um, the scrutiny committee closely examined the paper on Monday um, and members will have seen in, the, in your um, extra papers the uh, recommendations, the note which has come out of that. Um, at that meeting, Patrick Davies raised issues around archaeology and the bus station. Um, archaeology work does continue in line with best practice with the monitoring of the wall holes that have been done. Um, we are reconvening the archaeology panel to review uh, where we are and um, see what we do going forward. Um, as I said at scrutiny, the independent report being the panel produced to inform how we went forward is available on the City Council website if anybody wants to have a look at that. Um, with regard to buses, we have worked closely with County Council and bus operators to create an interim bus solution as part of our proposals which allow us to progress the long-awaited development of the site. But decisions about the long-term <coughs> future of buses and bus interchange in the city uh, will be made through the um, separate work that's been done on the Winchester Movement Strategy. Um, and I wonder if Councillor Todd would like to update us on where we are with the Winchester Movement Strategy. Um, yes, we are. Early next week, due to publishing the next set of reports on the City of Austin Movement Strategy, which does highlight the range of extra um, measures <coughs> that relate to buses in the city. Um, but the main thing that's going on um, in the light of the government's uh, bus back better strategy and the requirements uh, of Hampshire, the, the, the decision by Hampshire to sign up to that process uh, and produce a bus service improvement plan is that we agree with Hampshire as part of the strategy that we will produce our own uh, sort of bus strategy, um, looking at the opportunity for buses holistically in Winchester, not just looking at bus stations, but looking at fares, routes, um, a, a wide range of uh, issues um, that relate to buses. In essence, our goal is that we provide the county what they need for the bus service improvement plan for Hampshire to have the strongest possible plan for the Winchester district. Um, it will look at Hampshire priorities, uh, count uh, city priorities, whether that's bus priority measures, waiting areas, real-time information. It will look at what the bus companies can be doing in terms of routes, frequencies, fares, and tickets. Uh, and we're deliberately doing it to tie into the council's um, other strategies and priorities. Where do we need an interchange? How does it fit with the city of uh, Central Winchester Regeneration? But also talking about our route to zero carbon, talking about how we integrate park and ride with the other bus services in the city, uh, and how we support um, new route challenges, for example. Um, how can we do a better job of making it easy for people to get to the leisure centre? Uh, how we can use SIL and parking access funds to support buses. So there's a lot going on with buses that goes far beyond any question of where interchanges need to be. Um, and it's important we look at the system as a whole in terms of deciding the way forward rather than starting with where might we put a bus station in central Winchester. We need to look at a total city and total district plan for buses and then make sure that everything that we're doing, every element, uh, supports that. Uh, thank you, Councillor Todd. Um, Going through the other um, issues raised by scrutiny, um, the wider cultural piece is an essential building block of what we want to achieve here, appealing not only to younger people, but providing more family activities and reasons for overnight stays. 
not only are we bringing forward the creative quarter and an expanded events offer as part of the meanwhile work at King's Walk, but we are setting a high priority on continuing to work closely with the Hampshire Cultural Trust to bring to fruition their exciting vision for an Anglo-Saxon attraction at the Wall Staples Hall. Turning to governance, uh, we will bring a paper to full council prior to any cabinet decision to move to procuring a development partner, as well as giving the opportunity to scrutinise the outline business case to the scrutiny committee. Um, I have listened to the scrutiny committee views on the remit of the cross-party advisory group, take those on board, and we'll take further member soundings before agreeing the governance arrangements. Questions were raised about the level of external fees committed to this project. Um, we have strengthened that internal team with our interim director, John East, standing on office permanent replacement staff to oversee the next stage of the project and ensure we make best use of available resources. Um, and we're very grateful for him to doing that because we've certainly benefited um, from his advice. Um, it must, however, be recognised that we are a small district council with a small officer team. Um, and this project is very large and very complex in Winchester terms. We do not have the level of resource, whether that be legal, financial, planning, transport or design, to do all the necessary work required to get this right. From the work on the, on the SPD onwards, we have seen significant benefits from using external expertise. Not only have we had access to experts in their fields, but we've been able to use them as it is needed for the time that we need them. Um, moving back to the recommendations on the paper, we are being asked to approve the strategic outline business case and move forward to the outline business case. Um, we are also asking for additional funding for King's Walk. The majority of this is on the landlord works to repair and maintain the building. To a great extent, this is catch up after many years of neglect due to the uncertainty about development, um, and it is needed to keep building in use for the next few years. In addition, because we're not moving forward with the full scheme for King's Walk, we propose to activate and animate the area over and above the works already agreed, um, as was referred to by um, Ferry Lines earlier. King's Walk is at a key juncture in our high street. And at a difficult time, this is an important opportunity to provide something different in terms of retail and activities, starting to build that creative quarter and bringing in and keeping people in our city for longer. Um, so I'm very pleased to be bringing this forward um, and hope that Cabinet will approve it. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Learning, and thank you, um, Verilyn, for your really interesting uh, slide presentation, which I know a number of us have seen several times now, but um, it, 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 it was um, good to see it again. Thank you. Um, I have a number of public speakers who wish to, to speak on this item, so I'll call them in order. Um, first up is uh, Mr. Kim Lottley. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning to you. And good morning to all of you. The Council says it will comply with the National Planning and Policy Framework and preserve the site's archaeology in situ. The policy framework doesn't actually say that it must be preserved in situ and all options should be considered. The key point is that if you are going to preserve anything, either in situ or put it on display, you have to know exactly what it is you are preserving where it lies, its present condition, and what measures are required in the future to ensure its preservation. As Professor Middle tells us, and all experts will confirm, the only way to establish these facts is by excavation. All holes and x-ray surveys may assist, but they are only the start of the process. At some point, someone is going to have to excavate the site. There are three good reasons why the council should do this work itself before it sells the site or enters into the joint venture. The first is that when faced with uncertainties, all developers will include substantial provisional sums in their calculations, all of which
which will be deducted from any payments they make to the council. The difference in cost allowances will be significant and it will be a lot cheaper for the council to commission the work itself. Second, many developers won't bid, bid for the site where there is sensitive archaeology. By clarifying what, re what remains exist and where they lie, the council will de-risk the site and attract interest from many more developers. More developer interest will translate into the council receiving more money for the site. Third, by retaining the site until its archaeology has been investigated, the council will preserve all its options and will leave it free to either sell the site or put artifacts on display or facilitate the development of a museum to hard house whatever is found. When what is down there is fully revealed, its future, its future should be a matter of public debate and with respect, not be the decision of just a few individuals. It's also the case that the council will do a better job of excavating archaeology. Developers will inevitably be focused on the development and because of financial and time pressures, they will be looking for expedited solutions, i.e. shortcuts. As a responsible authority, with an interest in the heritage and future of the whole city, the council can ensure that no shortcuts are taken and that best practice is followed in all respects. Because Professor Biddle's comments apply to the area east of Tanner Street, there is no reason not to immediately progress the regeneration of areas west of Tanner Street. Accommodating this strategy will need a bit of a rethink, but this is just the time to be doing that in advance of making critical decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next on my list is um, Mr. Terry Gould. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Hume's fully set out the importance and desirability of doing something now about the archaeology, which uh, you have flagged up in this report and others. So uh, I don't need to go on about that. What I am interested in, one, is how and when are you going to do an actual urban design master plan for the site? Because for my knowledge of contract law is maybe not huge. I cannot see how you can uh, get a contract with a developer without something to base it on. And unless you have a plan that you can then judge progress against deviation from uh, cost, of course, I don't see how you can do it. So why can we not go ahead and find somebody suitable we had a good start with uh, JTP. In fact, they even did produce the plan that some of us have seen. Uh, it may not be perfect, but it was produced. Um, it can be done, and there are sufficient experts who would be very happy to do it that know a lot about his history, small sites, important towns, that sort of thing. Uh, and then you would have something to actually base a contract on. Other than that, I don't see how you can have a legally enforceable contract. The other is the proposal that we have with the blue lines, blue lines, etc. It does deviate quite a bit from the SPD. Now my understanding is that is a legal document that the council adopted and things like, I mean, leaving out, maybe it's the facing, but leaving out the Broadway, for one. You talk about connecting up bus stop lane, or to what? There won't be anything done on the Broadway. And yet the Broadway is one of your most significant public and entertainment spaces that we have. It's there. And with minimal work, it can be made safe and improved. Um, I can see waiting on uh, the uh, Parks and Fences building until that's all clarified and everything. But King's Walk is always a puzzle. It's not very nice. I know you're getting some income from it, uh, but you're going to have to put out a lot of expenditure. So why this scattergun approach? Why not a plan? Why not 
do it in an orderly fashion. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, Mr. Arthur Morgan. Good morning and thank you. Um, Richard Baker, who many of you know much better than I, um, should be here. He said to me, it's his statement, and I, he asked me to read it for him. Unfortunately, he has been pinned in his urban bubble, and that has put him in isolation. Members of the Cabinet have been sent a letter from the City Risk Trust expressing strong concern about the direction being taken on the development of the planning processes to regenerate the central area. We are now three years on from the adoption of the Supplementary Plan Guidance in June 19, 29, 2018. Since then, we have had a series of, of abandoned and meanwhile uses and feasibility studies. We have had to live for many years with a damaged and blighted site in the centre of our city bounded by expensive hoardings, proclaiming Saturn Gate, building a city for the future. The Trust urged in the letter the Council take two measures to get this project on track and maintain compliance with the guidance set out in the adopted SPD. The first measure is to have a development process that engages with multiple developers, not a single developer. The second measure is for the Council to produce a master plan that will be subject to public consultation. A master plan would work out the planning and urban design framework set out in the SPD to a level of detail that developers would require in order to prepare detailed planning applications. Both these measures will enable the Council, both as landowners and planning authorities, to maintain strong control over the, over the development. Development should be an exciting experience. This project has a history that started in 1995 with a local plan proposal for the mixed use regeneration of Silver Hill area. The Trust is sad to say that after 26 years, excitement has turned into exasperation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I know a couple of councillors who would also like to speak on this item, and the first one is Mr. Hoyle. Good morning, Chair, and thank you for allowing me to address the Cabinet this morning. It's slightly odd to uh, talking to uh, Paul Fanny and Councillors. But um, uh, most of this is probably for, for Kelsey's attention. Um, I welcome uh, the paper today, uh, which has been a long time coming, but it is very welcome. And thank you to the officers and consultants who have prepared the document and for the thorough review that took place at scrutiny on Monday evening. However, from a government's point of view, it is a pity that you have chosen not to allow a broader review of such an important project in particular council at this stage. I note that the decisions later in the year are ready to be made by cabinet on the OBC. You have yet to set up the reference group, which has been much promised. We look forward to that. And we see no other forums planned in, just straight back to you, cabinet, to this group to make a decision. On Monday at Scrutiny, there was a debate about potential challenge I can see no surer way of expecting that than by making decisions in this way. If you want to support your plans, stand up and be counted and allow all the members of council an equal chance to participate. The officers may tell you you do not have to do this, but you do if you want this project to succeed. I hear what Councillor Nandy has kindly said this morning in response to the scrutiny recommendations. And I hope the statement today from the portfolio holders will bring the full case to Council, not some derivative that is devised. The SPD tells you uh, that you have full resident support for this project. It advises you what to do 
your own recent consultation confirm this piece of work. So let's use that as a cornerstone for the decisions the Council needs to make. Unfortunately, your paper today fails to deliver on all of the SPD, partly because you would redraw the site in question. I ask the Cabinet to commit formally to the other projects running on in parallel, such as Hall Stapers Hall and the HCT initiatives. I understand they are subject to commercial decisions, but we can put a marker down. You cannot deliver the maximum option 1.4 on the paper within the footprint you are advocating. So let's just be honest with everyone with what this new project now entails. King's Walk in this paper has become a complete red herring in my view. Thankfully, the go to loan option has been abandoned. It is not the initiative of a, a, the initiative of a creative quarter proposed in the SPD that is in question. We all support that, the King's Walk itself. The building has become a focus to mitigate political risk, as the intelligent report. It is a misguided approach. And when you can deliver the creative portion in other ways on the site and preserve the businesses in this area, why wouldn't we and save money? I challenge your investment objectives, which have been commented on over recent weeks, but still you haven't listened. You claim they amalgamate the SPD and the council plan, but I'm afraid there are some fundamental elements that have a light touch or are missing. Other speakers have mentioned some of them this morning. Limited reference to sustainable transport, light touch on heritage and culture, and certainly the missing piece of archaeology. It is as if these have all been dumbed down. I ask you to think about these again so that we know how we're assessing the project. I can see that you want to get this project over the line, and many of us support that sentiment. I can assure you of that. But there is still much you can do differently to improve the chances of success. And I urge you to think about some of those details before we proceed. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to speak this morning. Thank you very much, Councillor Horrell. Um, I now call on Councillor Cook. Good morning, Madam Chair and portfolio holders. I do welcome document that is here before us. I have three items to speak about. Consultant speeds, the bus station, the bus hub, and archaeology. So let's start with the first one. I sit on the scrutiny committee and on Monday I made the request to make sure that there was transparency at all times as the consultant speeds to date have escalated and to also ask that we will be provided to all members of the committee, not just the cabinet, and figures that are not are just put in the press. Our residents on the Winchester district deserve to know. We moved to the bus station, bus hub. To say it was, I was saddened and shocked when I heard in the scrutiny committee that one of the most important issues for our residents in the Winchester district, the bus hub, was being let out of the business case. We know the movement strategy is being used as the reason to deny this part of the development in the short term. But unfortunately, we did not hear a long term commitment to the reinstatement of this part of the project despite what I've heard this morning from Councillor Todd. So the question is, are we here to... So the question is, are we in Winchester going to give, have a bus hub? Despite what is written and quoted in the papers, as I say, it referring to papers again. One quote was from, I believe, Councillor Lerney as being quoted as saying, the council are looking to improve bus services, note services, but not necessarily retaining a station. I'm pleased to hear this morning what's been said. Now we have archaeology. Best practice is a phrase I hear often being referred to. We have failed as a council to be on top of archaeology. Archaeology decisions could significantly impact the scheme's viability, but hardly a mention in the strategic business case. I ask the question, why is this? A full archaeological excavation surely has to be completed. I've heard about x-ray and boreholes have been referred to by the council, but not a full excavation. Professor Biddle has an enormous amount of experience 
And although at Scrutiny on Monday it was mentioned that he had not made contact with us, I then suggested that perhaps we should make contact with him. Let's build a city that we can all be proud of and not make this a political slanging match. I'm proud to be a city councillor, as I know many of you are around this table. So please allow full council to assist your decisions on moving forward to make this a better place for people to live in Winchester District. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Cook. And that concludes all the um, public participation and uh, councillors' uh, um, comments um, on this item. Um, <coughs> Councillor Lurie, I don't know whether you'd like to come back on any of those points. Um, and Councillor Todd also, perhaps on the board there. Uh, Councillor Lurie first and then Councillor Todd. Um, thank you, uh, Leader. Um, I really do think people should go back to the independent report that was produced by the archaeology panel and actually read its recommendations about the way forward, uh, which is what we're doing. Um, we are reconvening it in order to gain further understanding and to find out if anything has changed um, with regard to what is recommended best practice. I mean, certainly in December 2018, when talking about the report, Professor Biddle said um, it's impossible to say where a big dig should be much better to preserve is the only intellectually responsible thing to do. So I think I'd like to, I really want to understand why he's reversed his position on that and I think it's important for the council to understand that before we make um, commitments to go one way or another. Um, certainly we are getting in touch with Professor Bigel, I don't know if that's happened already in the area. Yes, thank you. We, we, we've been in touch with Professor Bigel, we we're arranging for him to come in just to have a chat and we're also be in touch with the other members of the archaeology panel to so reconvene. Yep, thank you. Um, with regard to the other points that were made, particularly around master planning, um, I think it would be useful to have some officer comment about that. Um, the presentation, which we've made a number of times, does make clear um, how poorly master planning inside ourselves works for the council. Uh, we do not have the level of expertise required to go down that route, nor do we have the, the financial resources. Um, there's been much comment made out of about you know external advice um, and the fees for that. Well, um, we're talking about an awful lot of external advice that would be needed to go down that route um, at incredible expense um, and risk as well. Um, so we, that was something that um, Cabinet explored really strongly um, throughout um, the earlier part of this year because we were really keen to understand whether we could make that work. But we've come to the, we've come to the conclusion, and it's clear from what's been presented why we've done that, that um, procuring a development partner is a better way to go. Um, with regard to governance, um, I have made a commitment that this will come back to council. Um, we need to take further advice from officers around the processes that we need to go through for that and um, what decisions uh, need to be made in which places. But certainly there will be a council vote on whether we proceed with this. Um, and that will happen in the autumn, and I'm very happy to commit to that. Um, I think at that point I'll hand over to Councillor Todd for the buses, and then I think we need to go back to Officer Stan and a couple of the other points that were raised. And Councillor Todd, the Broadway. Broadway, yeah. Um, yes, a few thoughts about the Broadway. The first thing is there have been big improvements to the Broadway recently. We now have the Sunday market there, and it wasn't possible before. Uh, and that's a really good example as to how we are taking a whole council approach to delivering the SPD. To be absolutely clear, the improvements to the Broadway were not done by the Central Winchester team. They were done by the movement strategy team and the transport team. Because in practice, if you want to improve the Broadway, the first thing you have to do is redesign the streets so that you're not sending cars through it. Um, so the the um, 
the closure of Great Minster Street, which is an absolute unavoidable <coughs> precondition to improving the broadway, has been done by the transport team, backed by the movement strategy, backed by Hampshire County Council, working together in order to drive improvements on the broadway. Um, there are two further elements that people will become aware of uh, when the next round of movement strategy reports are published. Is firstly, again, the detailed engineering work in order to get the buses off the Broadway and the cars off the Broadway, again, is going to be done through the movement strategy um, and is being done through the movement strategy. Um, uh, it is a Hampshire highway, uh, and so inevitably they quite like to be involved in what happens to their bit of land. Um, that, so you will see uh, you will see proposals for how our buses can be managed and routed in the centre in order to reduce the number of buses on the Broadway. Um, you also see the so-called LC Whip, uh, which highlights the walking route from the railway station down the High Street, down Broadway, down to the Leisure Centre as, a, as the number one priority route for improvements in the city. And engineering and public rail studies are being done uh, at the moment to see, um, to pro provide the information that is needed primarily by Hampshire as the Highways Authority to bid for improvements to those spaces from suitable government funding. But let's be, uh, as an example, if you want to remove buses from the rural unless you want a high carbon, high pollution solution which involves every single bus going all the way around the railway system which make buses less reliable, less timely. Um, you need to have two-way fries for it. There is no alternative to that. You have to be able to, if you're, if you're not turning buses that go to the east of the city in the Broadway, you have to turn them somewhere else. That requires two ways. Uh, um, that requires two-way Friars Gate and, and two-way um, Upper Brook Street, the section between Friars Gate and St George's Street. And again, that sits with the movement strategy. So I think it's very important that when we are looking at how we deliver improvements to the city, um, particularly on the question of the Broadway, that we recognise it will be a total council approach. It will be a partnership approach, primarily with Hampshire County Council as the owner Broadway uh, and the responsible authority for the Broadway. And that work is underway, including looking, uh, identifying how we can bid for funds in order to drive the kind of improvements in the Broadway that people want to see. Um, thank you very much, Councillor Todd. Um, uh, very good. I wonder whether you, uh, you were able to pick up on any of the comments that some of the speakers made. Uh, master planning, etc. Um. Yes, happy to, happy to do that, Chair. Um, with regards to master planning, I think, again, referred to in the presentation, once we have a development partner that we are comfortable with, that we ourselves have chosen and that we will be working in partnership with, we will then be able to sit down and look at that. The SPD does go quite a long way already to specify obviously the mixed uses, the quantums. So I think, um, and again from previous experience, if, if we were to deliver a master plan with all the risks and the cost that Council Learning had already mentioned, you know, it's very likely that a development partner would come along with, with different ideas, potentially better ideas, and it <coughs> would have to be revisited anyway. So rather than incur the expense of doing it ourselves to then revisit it, um, it's far better to sit down and do one in partnership with the development partner. As you know, I don't know if there's anything else you have to say on that. No, thank you very much, Rowan. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any questions from members of Cabinet? <coughs> Councillor Clear. Thank you, Regan. Um, not so much a question, but I'd like to talk about King's Walk or just a short few words about King's Walk. Having visited there recently on several occasions, and I've just sat and observed, I've come to the conclusion to me that King's Walk is currently a magnet, and it's a magnet for antisocial behaviour. 
The area needs to be revitalized now, sooner rather than later. And I just think that there are options for the medium term, if you like, but I think it's a, an exciting opportunity. Let's get on and do something there and to create more cultural activity at this early stage. It needs it. It, having sat there, I mean, we removed seats, we removed fountains, but we have the little walls still sit, sitting there. And yes, there are a lot of people sitting there. Um, <coughs> some of the wording that they use is not attractive. So please, I just think that we need to revitalise this area much sooner rather than later. Thank you. I'll take that as a question leader. <laughs> um, yes, King, King's Walk is a problem area for the <coughs> town at the moment, so we do have an opportunity to change that. Um, uh, Councillor Cleese talked about public seating. Uh, which over the years we've removed to try and remove the antisocial behaviour. Actually, what we want to do now is put it back and make it an area where families and everybody else can sit and enjoy something a bit different in Winchester. You know, we have a street food market there. You know, already there's, opportun there's opportunities for people to sit and enjoy a bit of street food. Um, and we want to, to really change things around there, and this is a really good opportunity to do that. Um, thank you very much. Yes, I would just like to add on the King's Walk. Um, <coughs> the last thing we want to do is to see that um, that building completely boarded up waiting for development to happen for you know the next 18 months, uh, two years whilst we um, take the next steps. Um, our high street needs support and carrying work out for on meanwhile use um, in a much lesser fashion than we had originally envisaged and I would, I would have hoped that people would be happy with that because um, when we originally announced that we would like Kings Walk to be there for the next 10-15 years, we were met with this, it's an awful building to get rid of it as soon as possible. So we're now going down that route, but we're doing it in a way that keeps the businesses going at the moment, it keeps the, um, the property from uh, not being boarded up and just sort of sitting there for a number of years um, whilst we uh, take the next steps. So I, I think this is a really interesting and a really exciting way forward, uh, which supports our high street in a time when they're really the high street really needs it. Um, anyway, we seem to be into debate now. So um, cabinet members, uh, Councillor Gordon Smith. Yes, I rather agree with Angela that something needs to be done there, and the best way to get rid of antisocial behaviour is to get more people going in there. I mean, I've done a couple of sites in London of underused parks, uh, used by drug addicts, uh, drinkers, what have you. And if you read back them, you get other people going in there. They tend to displace the troublesome users. And of course, uh, this might very well happen when, they, when you uh, demolish fries again and there's a more remote area, but that will become more attractive to people who want to sit and drink cider in the sunshine. <laughs> so the problem is, of course, is the balance you get between how much money you spend on the short term. Uh, I think you have to spend enough to get the job done sufficiently. Um, thank you very much. Um, any further comments from other Catholic members? Councillor Cutler. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, as as a, a member from uh, um, a long way from the city centre, it has taken me a long time to get into um, really understanding the detail of, 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 of this process. And I can understand the desire for there to be this grand scheme that's all set out and we um, uh, agree it all and hopefully then just set on the path of um, building. The SPD 
does create that framework for that whole area, but it also does include talking about an incremental development. And in a way, this is part of the incremental development. It's taking a part of the size that we have control of. And um, this paper is about that part of that incremental development. And so, from my perspective, and particularly in, in concern about the finances of the council, it is important we take this step so that we can do the further analysis. If we spend time arguing that war should be included, that this isn't quite the right direction, we have been through, the presentation makes it clear that Balancing risk and cost, this leaves us the best option. And until we have that decision, we cannot get into the, 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 the detail, the nitty gritty. We also are not in a position at the moment to look at the external funding until we get to that next stage. So it's crucial if we want to get progress that this stage goes through at this time. Thank you very much, Councillor Cutler. Um, Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Lydia. I welcome this paper. I think we're finding a lot of opportunities to move ahead with a, a highly sustainable development in Manchester. Um, our climate awareness declaration that it's net zero carbon targets in district will play, play a critical part of the process going forward. And it will be a fabulous opportunity to show these innovative new techniques and materials and we'll be excited to play the part in that. Thank you very much, Councillor Murphy. Any further contributions from the cabinet members? Councillor Todd. Um, thank you, Leo. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to back up several of the comments that have been made. Um, I share people's concern about the the desire to avoid the big grand scheme. Um, and, and that isn't what's in front of us. It's very clearly talking about phasing, it's very clearly talking about incrementalism, it's very clearly talking about, uh, and, and we still have absolutely the option for multiple architects, multiple designers. I think it's important that we keep moving ahead. Um, I think it's also useful if we remind ourselves as to you know what. If we think back to 2018 when the outline delivery strategy was set in place, already then the emphasis was very clearly shifted from the one developed from multiple developer model to uh, saying, in fact, there's an explicit reference in the 2018 paper to a single developer multiple architects model, um, talks about delivering improvement through phase high quality development rather than one monolithic scheme. And that is exactly what we have basically decided to do. Um, it also talks about uh, whilst the development approach is underway, ensuring that vibrancy and a sense of action is achieved through implementing meanwhile uses, smaller development and public realm improvements where practical and cost effective. And again, that's exactly what we're doing. So I think it's important when um, you know, people realise that, that to a certain extent, the train, is, the train at least uh, partially left the station from 2018 in terms of some of the issues that people are arguing about. Um, I think there's also need to trust the SPD. The SPD isn't just isn't just meant to be a roadmap for how the council develops the site. It's binding on any potential developer, and it's binding on the county council. It's binding on city council as planning documents. It's it's binding on you know Mark Spencer's. It's binding on all kinds of people in terms of anything that anybody wants to do anywhere within the SPD area. We shouldn't treat it as if it's less than it is. Um, and so I think it's important that, that we recognise that a lot of what people want to see is, is covered through that. Um, and, I, and I think it is, I touched on earlier the fact that the movement strategy you know, will be delivering part of what people's expectations are for central interest to regeneration. I think it's important to highlight that we very much have a team based approach in terms of that. You know, when the movement strategy talks about anything that relates to central Winchester or discussions, then we make sure that somebody from the central interest team is in the room and that we take a similar approach 
uh, when central ridge is going to be talking about bus facilities to make sure that somebody from the transport team is in the room. This is a, a full council project uh, and it's important that it's seen that way. Um, so I'm, I'm happy with what this paper is asking us to do. We had the option of the big bang that's to invest lots of money um, in, in King's Walk. Um, we have done the detailed work in thinking as to whether that's a viable option. We've listened to what people have to say about it. There is a desire to energise that area, but what has come through is we're very firmly in the space for meanwhile use rather than you know a high investment project for the long term. And I think that needs to guide us as we go forward. It's a clear example of where we've listened to what people are saying to us, where we've looked at what the numbers are telling us, we've been practical in terms of what's possible. Uh, and, and I believe that we're taking the right route forward. And I believe that approach will be the one that we continue to use in the future. So I'm with everybody else in terms of saying, this gives us a chance to keep moving. Um, it gives us a chance. It gives us a chance to do, frankly, what people really want, which is a range um, of a, a not a monolithic big bang scheme, but phased high quality development to um, borrow the language from the previous cabinet, um, and is worthy of our support. And what I hope is that we continue working through in detail, we continue to scrutinise, engage with the public, and use that process to drive ahead to a better scheme that unlike what's happened since 1995, actually happens and gets us into it. Um, thank you very much, Councillor Scott. Um, I don't know, no, 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 no. Um, right, sorry, Councillor Lenny. <laughs> um, okay, before we go to the recommendations, um, we need also to consider the exempt paper, and I wonder whether the Chief Executive would enlighten us as to the way forward. Thank you, Leader. Um, perhaps if I just summarise where we are this morning in the Cabinet with this decision. You have a report before you that sets out all of the work to date with respect to the decision today. It sets out the engagement, gives you data points and information regarding proposals and financial data, some of which, which is in the uh, exempt appendix. I'll return to that in a moment. Today, you have heard Councillor Loney introduce the item, and our colleague Varian Lyons has uh, presented uh, some PowerPoint slides which are listed on the committee pages with the report. They form part of your consideration today, however, they have all been seen by the public in various forms before here. Councillor Loney has also uh, set out the comments and responded to them, those made by members of the public at scrutiny on Monday. And she has also reviewed and outlined comments made by Scrutiny on Monday, which have also been provided to Cabinet uh, and all members last night. So they are available for your review. This morning we have heard comments from members of the public and members have responded to those uh, as the meeting has progressed. We have also heard from officers who have provided additional information and from Opposition members who have also given views and comments and asked questions, and you have responded to those. There are a set of recommendations before you, and one of them requires you to have considered and whether you agree to progress the, uh, to the next stage of development. For this, members, you need to consider whether you wish to review in exempt session the exempt item which contains financial information. In summary, I can advise you that the Scrutiny Committee considered this report in exempt on Monday. Councillor Learning and Councillor Cutler were in the room, and I'm aware other members were online at that call. Leader, you may wish to move an exempt if Cabinet wish to ask questions, seek points of clarification, or debate the matters in those exempt appendix uh, in private. We will need a few minutes to reset the room to enable that to happen. However, if Cabinet can say they do not have any points of clarification, they do not need to debate the matters in exempt, then you may proceed to consider the recommendation. However, we will need a positive affirmation from Cabinet that they fully understand the matters in Appendix 13 before progressing. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Chief Executive, for that clarification. Um, Councillor Todd? Um, 
Yes, I don't think, uh, uh, my understanding, well, I've read the exam papers, and they're primarily about the financial argument that choosing between two options, which is to go with a standalone King's Walk development and then a separate development agreement for the rest of the site, or a single development agreement. I'm not hearing anyone anywhere from scrutiny, from Canada, from the public saying, do a separate King's Walk standalone development and a separate development agreement for the rest of the site. So I don't think that there's a, and I, I don't have questions about that analysis that would lead me to want to revisit that. So I don't know if everyone else is in the same place, but I don't feel the need to go into it. Um, I think we're all of nine minds. Um, Carol, I know you had your men down and we did go into exempt. Um, we did go through this fairly thoroughly at scrutiny on Monday. Um, <laughs> it's basically, if you, if you want to speak on the exempt, then we'll have to go into exempt. But yeah. it's your decision that you go to the exempt. But I might go to exempt, I would like to speak. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes. Members, if, if I may, may assist, uh, clearly Councillor Todd has indicated that he has listened and um, he is no uh, demur from the procedure to move uh, to the choices indicated before you this, this morning. However, it is about listening, it is also about your understanding and that you are content that you are able to make the decision to proceed to the next stage without considering the matter in exempt. You must have a uh, colleague member in the room who wishes to make a statement in exempt. I would suggest it would be appropriate for you to hear the point that she wishes to make. Thank you. Um, okay, in that case, we will go into exempt. Um, can I have a second of that? That's it. Thank you, Leela. If we just might take a few moments to reset the room. Colleagues on the call, please bear with us, and members of the public who are listening will be back. Um, welcome back everybody. Um, we've now uh, come out of the exempt where we've had a discussion around um, the figures uh, in, in that paper. Um, before we move to recommendations, I would like to make a, a few comments. I think we are at some really exciting points here in, in, the, um, in the progress on central Winchester. I think we've had a really good debate over the last few weeks on, on the paper that you see before you. Um, not least on Monday night when um, many of us spent four hours at the Scrutiny Committee going through the paper section by section. Um, so I think we've all had a really good opportunity to understand more about the plans and how we've reached the point um, that, that we've come to today. Um, we've also um, uh, compiled a huge amount of evidence from all the consultations that have been taking place over quite a few years now. And I think our residents are saying to us, they really want to see this part of the city transformed and they want to see it transformed into a vibrant, exciting area, which will provide new jobs new homes and really great open space. And so I think there's a real sense with, uh, within the community and across the council as a whole that we really need to get on, to, on with this. We've already agreed, as, as members of cabinet will know and other councillors, that we've already agreed the demolition of the old Friesgate building to open up the waterway and create a temporary park um, on that part of the site, and I believe this really demonstrates a, a real commitment to begin the transformation that we are all talking about. So the recommendations uh, before us today moves that commitment one step forward, and of course there's much, much more work that needs to be done on this, and, and there are going to be lots of bumps along the way and obstacles that we will need to get round. But we need to make a start. We do have to make a jump to the next step. And I believe these recommendations help us do that. So I'm fully supportive of them. Um, we have considered, as I say, the, uh, the matters in the extent dependence. 
Um, and I'm really happy to support these recommendations before us. Um, and I hope Cabinet will as well. They are on page 14 of the Cabinet report, there are quite a few of them. Um, Cabinet, are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who's made um, uh, uh, comments to us this morning and come along to see us in person. That, that's when we really help. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so moving on to the next item on the agenda, it's item number nine, the revised local development scheme. We have 3302. Um, and I'm going to ask Councillor Dawkins Smith, please, to introduce the paper. Right, okay. Well, at the moment, the stage we've got to is that uh, Adrian Fox is uh, processing all the responses, responses to the strategic, strategic issues and priorities consultation. And in uh, many ways, he's, uh, Adrian Fox and his team are a victim of their own success with their huge number of responses. And uh, we can ask him if you wish to list them all. Uh, but many of these responses run to 25, 30 pages. Um, and so there's a vast amount of work process to come up and to then sort them into categories. Um, and it's worth noting that they've uh, put in. Uh, for an award from the RTPI for their for the consultation process which was undertaken, which had to be quite a lot of it online, quite a novel way of pulling in more different opinions. So I think that he's to be congratulated and the other six or so in his team. And uh, of course, this also has to be the team uh, against the progress the problems created by the government planning white paper, which is uh, creating quite a lot of uncertainty in the way things are done, with, for example, the housing numbers varying up and down, and a lot of changes, of course, a bit like uh, yachts at Cowswick. Uh, so it's hard to tell exactly where the outcome will be. And I mean, one, one issue that, uh, that is in the white government white paper is the idea of the loss of right to protest and I think that should be a concern to all councils. Anyway, to get back to the point, um, the recommendations are really quite simple. One is to approve the revised local scheme which is set out in Appendix 1 and the second recommendation is to uh, delegate authority to the Strategic Planning Man Manager in consultation with, uh, with me <laughs> to undertake minor updating and drafting of any amendments required for prior to publication. Um, are there items anybody would like to ask them about? Um, Please make them simple. <laughs> yeah, not, we have to get Adrian in here. <laughs> Uh, Adrian's really, uh, Mr. Fox has really arrived, so thank you very much. Councillor Horrell, you have been to you'd like to speak on this item. Um, I would, Chair, thank you. Um, so thank you for allowing me to speak again this morning on this paper. And I welcome um, the paper, as it's another step towards the adoption of the new local plan by this council. Um, uh, but we are behind schedule. It's originally planned, I believe, to have been adopted at the end of the year. Um, I note from the paper that there are three risks which are likely or highly likely that would have a moderate or major impact on the timescales for producing this plan, which will, by the time of its estimated adoption, take us six years to develop. Uh, that is without any of those likely delays. Um, I understand there have been delays due to staffing and obviously the government, uh, white, uh, the government paper suggesting changes to the planning system 
as well as uncertainty on the housing numbers for the district. Um, but I did have it confirmed to me by the Secretary of State recently uh, that the housing numbers are the numbers, we, we have them, and so I think we're in a good place to plan accordingly. Uh, but these types of challenges, I think, are the ones that we probably anticipate during any uh, local plan uh, cycle. Um, so that movement of the dates for the future, I think, is concerning. And the local plan is so critical to the shaping of our communities and our district, and so critical regarding the um, uh, meeting of the climate emergency targets. So I would ask um, what measures this administration will be seeking to implement to assist with unwanted development, development with higher carbon footprints that might be acceptable within this uh, new local plan, which will inevitably occur because of time. And I'd ask whether there are any measures that can be looked at in order to expedite the process, which is already behind schedule. And since the declaration of the climate emergency, and I don't know whether you listened to um, the US uh, government talking on this this morning um, on Radio 4, but uh, the world is waking up to all of this and uh, the current um, weather ex extremities are also reminding all of us in Europe and the Americas um, as to the issue we're tackling. But the, uh, the declaration of the climate emergency um, much emphasis has been placed on the essential role that the local plan achieves, um, um, plays in achieving the 2030 target. Uh, the timelines within the local development team paper estimate that the plan will not be adopted until 2024. So that's over five years after the declaration and leaving less than six years for it to have any impact on the 2030 target. So over the next three years, there will be some significant development projects, not least of which will be within the MDAs that have already been approved. So none of those houses will benefit from any of the green credentials that are intended for the new local plan, and therefore will be direct, and therefore will directly hinder our ability to get to that 2030 target that I know Councillor Murphy is keen on. With planning permissions lasting three years, is it also possible that developers may expedite their planning applications to be approved prior to the adoption of the local plan and therefore have building projects which could avoid meeting some of those new green credentials that we expect to have in our new local plan? So, um, Chair, I think there are a number of things that may not be able to be addressed today by the portfolio holder, but they are issues that we need to bear in mind and that uh, we must, as a council, work with all speed to try and process this. Um, I welcome the idea of the awards, but I hope that that isn't deflecting us from the real work of getting through the uh, content that has uh, so generously been provided by those who were consulted and that we can then get to the next stage of the local plan in the quickest possible time. Thank you for your time this morning, Chair. Um, thank you very much, Councillor Worrell. Um, just quickly, last time we spoke um, at a uh, cabinet on the LDS, we were suggesting that the the consultation uh, period that set out ought to be longer because it fell within August and September. So I think that's more to um, lengthen that time uh, even further, which would um, inevitably cause more delays. I'll make that point. But, Councillor Gordon uh, Smith, would you like to comment on the last points? Yes, indeed. Um, well, I think one of the things is that that uh, developers can only be held to improve standards when those have been passed into law, such as the Biodiversity Act. As much as uh, the City Council would like to push developers to provide those things and to have, for example, with the houses, uh, passive house standards rather than the present ones, they can't be forced to do it. Uh, 
by any uh, local development plan. You can only push to the existing standards as they are, and as soon as they improve standards come in, we'll be right on it. Um, hope that's sufficient answer. Um, Mr. Fox, I believe you'd like to come in here. Thank you, Lena. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Council, for your questions. Uh, I can just pick up on a few of those. Um, in terms of obviously unwanted development, um, we do have a five-year house of land supply, so in terms of obviously quite a lot of applications that obviously uh, we don't want to obviously commit, we do have a five-year house of land supply, so in terms of obviously quite a lot of those from developments, we are in a very good position. In terms of obviously uh, the climate emergency, that is obviously a very important issue to us, and obviously as you know, it was embedded in the um, strategic issue of priorities, what we meant by the carbon neutrality section. We are kind of hamstring a bit by obviously the government guidance in terms of obviously making it very clear that uh, only climate change should come through the building rates. And certainly over the next two to three year period, we do see obviously changes with the building rates uh, increasing obviously in on to address the climate emergency. That's uh, said, so we want to try and push the boundary slightly further than we can with evidence to obviously uh, make sure our uh, plan picks up on the Emergency. And in terms of obviously, um, we are working as fast as we can going through the representations. There were over 2,200 representations, as the report has said. Within those representations, there are numerous points that have to be kind of broken down and put into different sections. So there's a lot more than 2,200 comments, and we are working our way as quickly and as fast uh, as we can to process them in a timely way. And uh, we will be obviously setting up LPEC meetings uh, in the autumn time to go through those representations. Um, and uh, I'd say, in terms of obviously the risks, I do appreciate it. It's quite honest and the obvious about the risks that are uh, you know, on my radar. Um, it's very, it'd be wise of me to say, you know, if there weren't any risks, that would be a good example or anything like that. So I think it's just an honest approach in terms of the risk assessment. I obviously want to keep them my team, throughout the local plan process, I'll do my best to keep them. And obviously, uh, it's just one of those things that is unfortunately under control. So, it's just supposed to be honest in these situations with a risk assessment. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Um, Councillor Hall, I'm going to come to you first. Yeah, I'll ask for questions. Any questions? I'll just have a comment, really, in response to Councillor Hall's. Points, particularly on the climate emergency and, and John Kerry's statement um, or interview this morning. Um, he did make the point very strongly that the private sector's way and way ahead of government. You know, I think it was in response to um, the question as to whether a change of administration was technical um, would, would derail things. He did make the point that the private sector's way ahead. Uh, as a good Conservative, I which I hope you believe the market could provide us with this. Um, I think our role um, surely has to be the enabling role that we talk about in, in, in encouragement um, within the limitations um, of government policy. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Hall, any further questions from the so I can't see any hands. Oh, that's a Todd. Um, I have a lot of sympathy with making sure that we continue to approach the local plan in a sense of urgency, uh, because the climate emergency is urgent, moving ahead as fast as we can, while making sure that we end up with a document that has legal steps that's standing and actually does what we want it to in terms of influencing. Um, influencing how houses and how development happens in our district. I think it's important that we don't undermine uh, or, or, or underplay the contextual problems we've had in the context of the government's um, strongly pro-developer um, consultations that are going forward. I mean, it's certainly the case. Let, let's not forget that there was a period of time where the government were explicitly stating that we should increase our housing levels in ground, something over a thousand, a huge increase in numbers. 
that would have required us to completely rewrite the plan. And it's understandable, you know, uh, when there are still proposals the government's talking about restricting people's right to protest and to object to, to housing developments. Um, and that, that people are nervous about this. We need to make sure that uh, we continue to offer protection of green fields and other such things that people care a lot about, whilst also making sure we protect the fabric of our, our, our city, uh, our cities and towns and villages as well. By, um, not over overcrowded. We need good, well planned development and we need to get this plan right. Um, and we need to make sure we're protected, that we don't get pushed into things. You know, I know people are very nervous about the South, which is a golf club, because we purchased by certain political parties, one of their biggest donors, uh, who has recently pushed through massive housing development on a golf club outside of those so. So I can understand why people might get nervous, but it's important that we have a robust process that provides adequate protection to make sure that the right kind of development is happening against these people's districts. We're not being pushed around by developers, um, but moves ahead as fast as we can. And, you know, there's nothing to say either. We aren't allowed to come back with a revised um, local development scheme if we find roads to be faster for whatever reason. And we need to I think be mindful of that uh, and recognising the urgency because I suspect what we're seeing at the moment, you know, if it comes to the hottest days we remember, we've seen some of the rainfall we can remember in the parts of Europe. We've actually seen within the last you know two years some of the heaviest rainfall that we've seen in Richardson and places flooding that have never flooded before. So this is urgent, and I think as long as we all make sure that every stage of the process, we're doing what it takes to provide the protection and the, the positive plan for which is the, that this uh, that, that we need, that we're doing so in a context of recognising the extreme urgency of the climate challenge that we face. If there are ways to accelerate things uh, and other levers we can pull to get action on improving the environment and standard housing. Um, and Thank you very much, Councillor Todd. Any further comments by Councillor Henry? No, in which case we'll move to the recommendation, uh, two recommendations on page 153. Um, are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Okay, we now move to item number 10, which is the Nuclear Nitrate Neutrality Update, pages 135 to 200 of the full gender pack, and it is tab 3301. Um, Councillor Gordon, would you like to introduce the paper, please? Uh, yes, of course. Um, well, the purpose of the uh, nitrate mitigation is to reduce the algae bloom that's happening in the solar. And this is caused by excess nutrients uh, being fed in from the rivers. And these are, can be nitrates or phosphates from farmland, and they can also be from animal waste or human waste from sewage discharge. And as you may know, raw sewage amounting to 20 billion litres has been discharged from southern water treatment plants. These include beauty, uh, Bugs Farm, Bosom, Forney, Ralston, etc., all along the south coast uh, of the, along the Solent. And uh, can't help wondering why management responsibility for specifically neglecting their duty in pursuit of profit is uh, that some directors are not behind bars. However, uh, we do have to cope with these very high levels of nitrates. And the one way of doing it, feasible possible way that's, that works, is in hand, is to take agricultural land out of production and develop it as woodlands and wetlands and meadows. And this, this is very much favoured by English nature. We've put together uh, land management schemes that are able to monitor. And manage the land in an appropriate way. 
the main purpose of the uh, the main recommendations are to develop a credit system. Uh, one of which will be to to sell credits to uh, small and medium-sized developers, and the second one is to um, basically uh, approve the service need to enter into uh, legal agreements for the monitoring of these sites. Um, and to um, pursue the option of joint purchase with neighbouring councils <laughs> on nitrate credits and to approve uh, a set of schemes which are listed in Table A um, to provide mitigation for residential developments. Um, so I think that sums it up as briefly as I can make it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any questions? Okay, any debate? Councillor Lillian. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I just wanted to speak in support of this paper. Clearly, the Council has its own new homeless program, and um, we do need to deal with the nitro mitigation we need for those projects going forward. Um, we, we know that um, actually it's a sewage system that needs sorting from the recent uh, prosecution of the sodden water demonstrates where the real fault lies. But unfortunately, we are going to have to deal with this for the, the medium term. And I think this is a, a good way forward, which is not only committing the council, uh, but will allow us to take practical steps to getting some of our, our developments and also some of these smaller developments that are sitting on the stocks uh, for private developers as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Cutler. Uh, thank you, Linda. The Captain Castle Gordon Spence is quite right against the search system. That's what's cancelled. Um, uh, this is a stopgap solution. Um, but it is a situation that we do find that simple that um, all house building has to make a it's, it's it's nitrate addition to the system. Um, it would not be sensible, I think, for us as a council to get involved in owning and managing huge areas of land um, that are far more sensitive to, to buy the credits. There is a problem for the smaller developers. So, um, in being able to purchase sufficient numbers, so uh, acting as a broker, I think, would be for um, the small developers. It, it is an important role to enable the house building to take place, and of course, we do need some of those credits for our own ambitious um, housing targets. So, I, I support this paper. Councillor Salt. Um, yeah, I also. Support this paper. I think it's a good solution to a frankly wholly inadequate national government policy situation, uh, and in particular, it fails to hold the water counter companies accountable for their failure to protect waterways and, 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 and local, local waters. Um, and it's it's a bit like the panic scan, where the people who've caused the problems are not being held to account for the problems that they've caused. You know, unfortunately, we can't put this in a recommendation, but personally, given that southern water had literally been dumping crap in the servants, um, frankly, I think they should pick up the tap for the whole thing. But unfortunately, we're not able to dismiss that at this council. Uh, you have to leave it to people higher up the chain to make that decision. Um, so I, I think we're doing what's right. But we're, it feels like we're in a kind of insane world where the people who are responsible for processing our water and make sure it is put into our waterways in a fit state and not doing so. And the entire um, you know, agriculture and housing, construction, and everybody is running around in circles uh, to try and fix this while these, frankly, 
unethical, near criminal, you know, polluters are allowed, as far as I can tell, to carry on unchanged. So I'm, you know, I'd, I'd like to thank um, Councillor Smith and the officers for what they've done, but you know, I, I beg for it deep down emotionally, wishing I could be voting to water the southern water, make them fix it. Thank you very much, Councillor Tolls. Um, Councillor Clear. Well, I think Councillor Tolls, the fact that he said everything that I was about to, so all I'm going to say is thank you to Councillor Gould Smith and the team and I support this paper. Thank you. Okay, um, so, um, um, just like to thank uh, Simon Finch, who's uh, done 99.95% of all the work. Um, okay, yes, uh, thank, thank you, um, Mr. Finch, for your work on this. Uh, could we now move to the recommendations, please? Uh, they're on page 186. Um, Cabinet, are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Um, uh, yes, just, just for our listeners, could I um, uh, apologise for any offence uh, caused by the use of the, um, the unfortunate turn of phrase that comes to talk to me? It's all about accurate sort of. Chairman, on a point of order, can we have a list of terms that we're not going to be using in council? That would be a good idea. It might be a bit complicated. Oh, it's all found with it. Anyway, right. Uh, on to item 11. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Finch, and thank you, Mr. Fox, for the earlier paper. That's great. Um, item number 11, which is the general fund outcome 2021, on pages 201 to 200 to 234 of the agenda pack. Have Three three only nine. Councillor Cullen. Thank you, Peter. Uh, this paper um, details the general fund outcome for the years in March 2021. Um, Kevin, we're well aware of the budget due difficulties caused by um, the pandemic last year and, and continue. Um, so last September, we, we bought a an emergency budget, an emergency budget, uh, in which um, it was estimated that there was a shortfall um, on our previous budget between eight and a half and twelve and a half million pounds. Very difficult to judge at the time, you know, where things would go. We based the budget, the emergency budget, based on a shortfall of ten point seven million pounds, of which five point one would be covered by government grant. That was the position we saw since the time. By making savings of just over a million pounds, uh, rejigging the uh, capital budget and use of reserves, we reduced the balance budget. So I'm pleased to um, be able to show on this paper that the outturn was 1.2 million pounds better than the expense of the emergency budget. That's due to the tremendous work of the finance department and within the council and keeping control and all departments and keeping control of the costs. Um, and and um, so we will not we have to use as much reserves as, as we would expect. So that's the key part of this paper. Um, we also uh, Included in the recommendations uh, are the transfer required to reserves as a result of the successful outturn. Um, we also recommend the agreement of the budget allocations to the and the pension grant and to approve the revised active program for 21 2. And no longer term we have the program of the department. Should both of us here to answer uh, detailed questions if, if, if required? I'm happy to attempt to answer. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, thank you very much, Councillor Cutler. Um, Councillor Godfrey, I, I gather you push to take on this item. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I'm very grateful for that. I'm all very grateful for the uh, cool atmosphere you're having here. I've been talking about uh, unethical and uh, near criminal activity from Councillor Dodd. I'm possible the phrases which fell foul of the uh, chief executives. Uh, um, but um, <coughs> having windows open and um, uh, the uh, air conditioning units blasting away and then wittering on about how important the time of relevancy is, is that people crystal at worst. Uh, I do think it's about time we turn off these machines uh, and live like the rest of us. Um, I'm sure that as uh, uh, fellow councillors, you share my concern that this important paper has not been considered by the scrutiny committee prior to consideration by this committee, as is required by the constitution. I was really surprised that it was the chairman of the audit and governance committee that proposed continuing Monday's meeting. Perhaps it is time to adjust the responsibilities of the committees if there is insufficient capacity to deal with the workload that now uh, has to be dealt with. Can I ask you, Madam Chairman, to uh, confirm that any decision that you make here today about this paper will be made subject to the review of the scrutiny comments once the scrutiny committee has had the opportunity to consider the paper. I would also welcome your confirmation that you will encourage the members of your group to sit on the uh, scrutiny committee to accept the need to include uh, this paper in the future agenda of that committee. Um, I will return at that time to consider uh, in more detail the um, uh, comments from the scrutiny um, uh, committee on this matter. Um, as acknowledged by uh, uh, Councillor Cutler, the importance of the government grants to um, uh, bringing out the um, uh, local authority um, finances across the country um, has made a big difference given the impact on our um, income of the pandemic lockdowns. Um, however, I think mean, the use of underspend um, in this paper uh, seems to be just bolstering the reserves, uh, principally the, uh, I think the business rates collection fund. Um, well, I would hope to see this windfall money um, being used more effectively than just squirreling it away. Our general fund income receives a base return of around 2.5 million, 2.7 million to business rates. Um, this outturn underspend, the gain to provide budget of um, 1.2 million, ensures the income from business rates is not affected. So, how is this underspend, this money, to be used for the benefit of ratepayers today and not those in the future? The revised budget last year reduced expenditure by just over a million pounds per annum including by reducing the number of council employees. Is any of the 1.2 million pounds underspend to be used to reinstate these redundant posts? I particularly think of a planning officer where so much more capacity is required. My final point is how the outturn and the underspend, particularly the better than expected income, impacts on the forecast of a budget for this and future balance of years. Can we expect a revised budget with a more optimistic forecast and a reduction in the charge that now seems unjustified in light of this outcome? Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Godfrey. Um, Councillor Cutler. Um, Councillor Godfrey refers to this as a meaningful in fact, takes us to the same position we were in, would have been in at. Uh, Based on our initial budget, the 1.2 million pounds um, that um, resulted um, from this outcome is exactly the position that we would be in if we were in the budget. Which, so it's not a question of being a uniform. We will continue to be, take a cautious approach with our finances to ensure we don't run into the long-term problems that we inherited. 
I'd just like to say, uh, yes, Councillor Robbery, you mentioned swirling away. Um, I think it was something that I used to accuse you of quite, quite often <laughs> in, um, in uh, previous years. But I also seem to remember that you, you kept telling us that we shouldn't be using reserves to uh, bolster our um, the shortfall in, in our in our um, in our budget um, in, in the past. So, yeah. which is it to be? It can't be this very yeah. way, or uh, and, and obviously not using reserves, or you know, kind of it both ways. That's what I want to say. Um, Mr. Bateson, and then Councillor Thank, thank you, Chair. Just one clarification in response to um, one of the comments that Captain Coffey made um, with regard to the 21-22 budget. When members approved that budget in February, or when Council approved that budget in February, it was based on the, the forecast that the 1.2 million was realised in this paper. Was, was, was to be achieved. So we were predicting one or two million at that time. The budget was set with that in mind. Um, we are monitoring progress very closely and we'll bring um, reports back to, to members. Um, we were assuming a 20% reduction in the money in this year and at the moment we are experiencing those at the level of that of the figures we have seen recovery in our farming as an example, but it's still going to stand on the budget that we So we'll keep on that and bring that back to members and as soon as we have the information. Thank you. Councillor Lillard. Um, I think I'm going to have to go um, a key aspect of this paper is how we stand the NHCLG homeless prevention grant, and I don't believe the cabinet should delay that for a scrutiny committee um, in several months' time. You know, those proposals include co commissioning and accommodation, uh, severe weather, emergency provision, young persons, emergency beds, and really importantly, flexible funding for us to respond quickly to do whatever is needed to put a roof over somebody's head or keep it there, whichever it is. Um, we're also proposing an increase in staffing, which will allow us to help another uh, 30 to 40 residents, um, which again is important. Um, also, in terms of thinking about the future, uh, we're well aware that the County Council are proposing to cut services for the homeless and vulnerable in the next few years. Uh, the proposed cuts in County Commissioning the homelessness support in the Winchester district amount to significantly more than our entire homelessness prevention grant um, and will severely damage the capacity of the voluntary sector to support this area of work. And some of that burden will undoubtedly fall on this council in the future. Uh, in addition, uh, proposed cuts to drug, alcohol, and mental health services. Um, are also likely to increase pressures in this area. And certainly, I believe if County does carry through the full level of cuts that they're proposing, we will end up with the bureaucracy that's back in Winchester's streets. So, we need to be aware of those issues that are coming in budgets come forward. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor Yeah, just to respond to Councillor Godfrey's comments about switching. Um, the law for our was for our discussion on the of which is uh, I don't think anyone would be expected to continue that meeting. As far as I understand it, the uh, management of scrutiny is in the gift of the chair. And uh, not of um, uh, not of the administration. So um, I, I think that's where you should be directing the questions. Yes, I mean, I personally, I strongly agree with the points that have been made about um, uh, county cuts. Uh, it, is, it is a matter of extreme concern. They are particularly brutal. 
and you know we don't know the full picture of the gap. We know, for example, what the serious kind of public health cuts looks like. We don't know what the gap looks like, which may put me further from uh, on the city's finances. We also don't quite know what recovery will look like, and obviously we put in a lot of work and effort to ensure it is as strong as it can be. We don't know what that is going to be like. We don't know how people will be returning to offices. Um, we don't know how well the people will be using it. There's a lot of unknowns that we need to deal with, and so it's quite a step group approach. You know. Imagine if we were still in the position of having 90 billion pound hold of finances, which no plan with no plan to address it, which was the situation um, we inherited. And I think the point about scrutiny meetings uh, is, is a fair one. I was on scrutiny before um, we uh, uh, before we took control. Uh, and I was looking at how many meetings I used to go to versus how many there are now, and the number of meetings is half. Uh, the allowance, as I say, is second, but the number of meetings is half. Um, and that's uh, that's a choice for the in terms of how meetings are scheduled and what the pace of work is to sort of keep up with uh, what the cabinet is doing. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no further um, no further debate, uh, we move to recommendations, please. Um, they are set out on pages two hundred and one and two hundred and two of the agenda pack. Um, are we agreed? Are we agreed? Thank you very much. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, item number. 12 for housing revenue account out to 2021 um, on pages 235 to 258 of the agenda pack and 338. Thank you, Leader. Um, I don't think there's much commentary needed on this paper. Um, once again, the housing revenue account is in a very good position. And I'd like to thank officers for their hard work over the past year um, in achieving as much as we have. Clearly, um, COVID has caused difficulties in some areas, um, but I think we've performed very well under the circumstances. Um, within this paper, we do have our proposals for the welfare fund for creation this year. Um, those plans enable us to give additional support to the crisis and prevent tenants going into debt. Increase digital skills, assist tenants to find employment, and give money and benefit of life. Um, very importantly, we will also be uh, increasing mental health support, um, an area where we see increasing need in our communities. Um, they would like the chair of TAC to raise various issues at scrutiny on Monday. Um, although there wasn't full scrutiny of the paper as has previously been referred to. Um, whilst all that's dealt with by um, this proposal earlier, um, one request that you do make was that we prioritise conventional council housing within our housing programme. Um, clearly, the middle scheme which we've recently agreed is a significant departure in tenure from the homes we've done in the past, but I do ex expect this will um, be relatively exceptional in terms of the proportion of the housing programme that represents. Um, I am committed to increase the number of council posts far in excess of what we use through right to buy. Um, we do have a responsibility, however, to consider wider housing needs and that one size no longer fits all. Um, no cost of ownership means the aspirations of many in our community, not just their needs. Um, and it also makes many of our students more viable and allowing us to increase the number of council posts we're providing. Um, in addition to those shared ownership or minimum market options. So, with that, I'd like to uh, recommend that we approve this paper. Thank you very much. Um, and of course, you had the comment in public participation by one of the early attacks, which, um, to which you still very to. Um, uh, yes, that was that was uh, that was raised by David Martin. Okay. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, Councillor Hall, do you wish to speak on this item? I do, Chair, but I'm going to steal, please forgive me, Housing uh, residents, a moment to actually refute the slur on the chair of the scrutiny committee that has been made by Cabinet Sinmay. 
The chair of the committee was asked to accommodate the central interested discussion on Monday. Quite right, we were all in agreement. But actually, that then led to an excessive agenda. And it was your side that actually called for an adjournment, so the outturn reports could not be considered. In my view, outturn reports are not just a matter of fact, they are then an indicator of what the future has to be, uh, what future actions have to be adapted. And there are influences, as Professor uh, Learning has just uh, indicated, regarding decisions that need to be made. And so that adjournment in the summer holidays is highly unlikely to happen, and we're going to be backed into a corner. So I think the chair of scrutiny deserves a, a, an apology, given that she acted on a request of you as an administration to change the agenda. I think it's absolutely outrageous, and it was your side that deferred the meeting of the month. Now, back to the most important area from uh, my point of view on council work, uh, the housing side, and I welcome the outturn report. I welcome the opportunity to reconsider this uh, at scrutiny in full. But there are a number of points I'd like to make today that are relevant to the document before you. And it's a question, I think, a couple of questions that I would have asked of the portfolio holder on Monday had I been given the chance. And that is uh, staff shortfalls um, that um, are perhaps leading to some projects not being able to be pursued. Um, are we losing staff? Um, do we have a higher turnover than perhaps we had anticipated? Um, we have offered up a number of heads in housing, assisted impacting our overall ability to deliver the service. Uh, particularly, there are a couple of elements in the report 12.3a uh, where you indicate that it has been uh, impacted. Um, also, uh, COVID has led to a number of elements being uh, delayed. The disabled adaption spot is hugely important for us, allowing people to remain in their own homes. Um, um, if the appropriate uh, adaptions are made. Uh, we've actually adjusted that down, but again, uh, given the recent circumstances, but can I seek assurances that we have this in hand because those needs will not necessarily go away. Um, I've been made aware that the Valley, which um, is um, under budget, and uh, we're proud to have those new houses, and, uh, we did that and obviously the support of the residents of Stanmore, um, but they uh, are experiencing some issues with storage with some of those buildings. So given the compensation under the nitrate issue, uh, maybe that's something the portfolio holder would like to update us all on. And I think that another important element already referred to in the general fund is potentially the um, uh, moves that um, might be made at Hampshire County Council uh, for their grant allocation, and what budgets and what provisions are we making based on our outturn report um, and some of those movements and budgets to uh, ensure that we have the right conversations. I think um, Councillor Learning and I are both in agreement that we should um, actually be lobbying and have an appropriate plan. So, Chair, I think there are a number of uh, questions there. Um, I would um, like to thank the officers for their dedication in the housing team. Uh, they've continued in difficult circumstances through the last year and obviously managed a, a complex set of uh, budgets, um, um, still keeping on track uh, with repairs generally, still driving forward on new homes, all of which I think we as a council uh, would collectively be uh, very uh, we as a council should all collectively be very proud. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to speak. Um, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hall. Um, I don't know whether Ms. Botham or Councillor Learning might want to respond to some of those points. Um, thank you. Yes, um, I agree. It is unfortunate that um, we didn't discuss this in scrutiny where we could have dealt with a lot of these questions. Um, which I think we'll cover in more detail when uh, that comes back. Um, clearly, it's unfortunate that this is nice to hear with us, with us today to respond to some of those issues. 
Um, something we have had some difficulties in recruiting, um, as you may be aware, a lot of people are, are thinking about uh, work, and um, we have had, uh, I think, more churn than usual, but I would need to further that with officers. Um, I don't know if Mr. Um, Bowden wants to pick up any of the other points at this time or wait until we um, do a proper job in scrutiny. <laughs> Chair, uh, I can make a, a, a general in addition to the comment cuts that have been made regarding staff. Um, there, have, there have been no cuts to staffing within the Housing Revenue Account Services. In fact, they have increased over the, over the last year. Um, this isn't an area. So the, the, the reductions that were referred to were in, a, in relation to having general fund services. So, so not the services company, but a part of the um, That means, in addition to the recruitment challenges that the council faces generally, um, we have had um, some um, um, problem, uh, so, some absences that uh, we didn't recover, and that has impacted particularly on the estate improvement program, um, where um, the office was responsible for that, um, was seconded to another team, and um, we, we then were unable to, to, to um, find a suitable replacement for that individual. So, very much specific circumstances, not a reduction in the investment in those things. Um, and this paper actually reflects an increase in investment in that service, um, which we've come out and we've now got that, that, that issue as well. And there, there are, we are aware of the, um, um, some, some of the, the difficulties that for one of the uh, new residents of Bay, and that's being specifically addressed by the new home scheme in conjunction with the developer. The developer will be responsible for rectifying that, that, that uh, defect in the, in, the, in, the, in the working of that. So, um, with, with regard to addressing some of the um, uh, challenges faced by you know, reductions in, in, in run from, from Hampshire, the, um, the, the welfare spend that Council Emily referred to said that today, is a specific response to some of those challenges that uh, we're likely to face, and, and also in ensuring that we continue to improve services in terms of having terms to, to maintain the terms of Thank you very much for both of them. Um, also, I would, I would also like to comment um, on um, uh, Hampshire County Council's um, budget proposals and the cuts. Um, on Friday, I did send a response on behalf of the Council to their budget um, uh, consultation um, and indeed um, with a letter as well. And I'm happy to send you a copy of that letter because, of course, um, as Councillor Lowry uh, mentioned, um, they're cutting a, a support to um, homeless people, uh, for instance, will actually, um, it, well, it, it will have an impact on the services that we provide, and we are really concerned that people will fall through the gap because, um, obviously, um, we may not have the, um, um, the resources to uh, fully support those people. And there, there is also the uh, cut to the Dublin Alcohol Centre being proposed. Um, and again, this will have a profound effect on, um, on our residents uh, in Manchester and what we as a council will need to do to help support them going forward. Um, any further questions on this paper? Any debates? No? So we'll move straight to the recommendations then, which are on page 235 and 236. Um, are we happy to agree with Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, then, um, Apologies, Chen. I'll go to the to leave for another appointment. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, turning to the next item on our agenda is uh, item number 13, for performance monitoring, pages 259 to 328 on the agenda pack, CAB 3297. Um, Councillor Carper. Thank you, Leader. Um, this report, uh, report, report uh, performance monitoring is 
that as you can imagine, uh, somewhat outdated at this stage. Um, since the one that we were just it is in process, the time that was meant to just one is coming to Canada. Um, the report was scrutinized in a lot of detail by um, both pre meeting asking for questions and then for this panel in, in June. One of the aspects on the note here is that appendix five, the notes from this panel do not appear to be in the back. Uh, and could I ask that, it, that they are um, ended to um, the report when that's it to answer the question. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Hall. Um, Chair, um, the performance panel, which is asked by the scrutiny committee to do the hard work on this report, uh, did so, and uh, there is an extensive list of questions, and indeed, officers have worked very hard to get answers for those so that they can be tabled. They did come to scrutiny on Monday, and unfortunately, this was a further paper that was not um, uh, reviewed. So you've had the performance panel assessment, and I hope that is uh, useful to the cabinet in your review, but obviously scrutiny haven't done due diligence on the work we have done um, on their behalf, and they obviously have the right to review that and to uh, answer the questions. Uh, so I'm assuming, despite the lateness of it, um, there is still some relevance to that process. Um, but Chair, um, I think the report, uh, if it is circulated to all the members, um, um, stands at its own merits. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hall, Councillor Hall, thank you very much. Um, so we just move to recommendations on page 259, which is that we note progress achieved during the quarter of 2019 uh, 2019 and endorses the of the report. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Final item on the agenda is number 14, which is the forward plan, which again is just noting. Are we happy to make the forward plan for this? Thank you to everyone who's made that sense questions. See you all again very shortly.